right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego, uh, rainy San Diego actually, yeah. which is not that, not doesn't happen that often. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Monique Allen, who is over the other side of the country in Massachusetts. How are you doing, Monique? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. The sun is out and we are snow covered. So there you go. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Well, to be honest, we had a bit of a heat wave at the weekend, so I won't rub oh. that in. Oh, sure. Rub it in. <laughs> go right yeah. ahead. It was three this morning. I'll rub that in. <laughs> 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 Excellent. And uh, Monique is a business coach and founder of The Garden Continuum and author of the book Stop Landscaping, Start Lifescaping, which is what we're going to talk about today. So, um, uh, Monique, let, let's get uh, let's get straight into it. Right. G give us the background to your 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 business and then kind of your evolution into into expanding it to be more about like life is not just, you know, go garden design or whatever, but life design. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So um, I started in this business very young. I fell in, was not aware that there was a thing called the landscape business, um, but I was, I was young. I was uh, 18 years old when I was introduced and lost and a bit of a trauma survivor. And so um, when I found it, um, it entirely regulated my system. I fell in love with it. I found all of a sudden I had purpose, I had meaning, and you know, all of that just rolls into, yes, let's do it. And so launched a career, right? Out of, out of nothing. And I got pulled, I think like anybody might be pulled into an industry um, in the, the sort of the colloquial sense of any industry, right? What's on the top, what's the norm, what's the sort of standard vernacular and all that kind of thing. And, um, and I was like that for about 10 years. And what happened is I started to see that there was a whole lot more there. I mean, there was design, there was, um, sustainability, there was the environment, there was, um, life force energy. I mean, it was all of this stuff. And so every single time I pulled on a different thread in the industry, it just kept me for a little bit longer. And that has been the seed of building the garden continuum, uh, which is my flagship company that does lifescaping. But as I started to really understand what I was doing, I realized I needed to codify it because I was mm -hmm. explaining over and over and over and over again, what I was doing. So I thought, Oh, I should write a book about that. And so there came Stop Landscaping, Start Lifescaping, which clearly is a bit of a tongue in cheek title because I landscape every day. It's really about the methodology and then also looking at it more broadly in, in one's life and in one's business. Yeah, no, no, fantastic. Uh, that's fantastic uh, background. And I guess, um, you know, a, a big part of it is that as you've gotten into this, I mean, as you've seen how it all evolves and you found all those threads, I agree with you, the uh, codifying something is, that's always, that's the hard part, right, is actually taking all the, because often people are unconsciously competent, right? I mean, they're really, really good at what they do, but they can't really explain to you or they couldn't teach you how to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So the so when you got into this process of codifying it, tell me tell me what was that process like? Ooh. Um, well, initially, you know, you you decide you're gonna write a book and and uh, do a little internet searching about writing a book, and it's like, oh, it's easy as one, two, three, write an outline and do this and do that, and you're gonna have a book and write a book in six weeks or in six months or <laughs> Okay, five years later, I had a book. But <laughs> the uh, what happened was that I had to peel the onion. I had to, mm -hmm. I had to look at what I was doing, and I had to ask why, and then I had to answer why, and then as I answered, I had to ask why again, um, because I think what I learned is that when you move into mastery, you've you've essentially climbed up the mountain, and you actually don't even remember how you got there. You, you don't know what you know, you, you don't know what you know, and you can't systematize it. And this is, I'm sure you see this, this is a big problem mm -hmm. in business. You know, when we're looking at something as straightforward as CRM, the reason why we have that is because it became so difficult to systematize hanging on to data and information so that it was retrievable. So I not only was peeling the onion of 
what was I embarking on? What was I trying to achieve with LifeScape? But I was also trying to understand how one does codify a thing, anything. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a heck of a lot of soul searching that goes into that because clearly I'm standing on a platform that, that I built. Um, but then you are also looking at adjunct narratives like you know the native species narrative, the organics narrative, the sustainability narrative, and asking yourself, what in these narratives fits in the lifescape model? Where am I a purist? And where am I really more willing and able to synthesize lots of information from different disciplines? So yeah, I thought it would take, you know, maybe a year, but it really took five years because, because I, I had a lot of work to do to, to tease it apart. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And part of it, what I see is um, like vital to to your um, to your success and to to every success. In fact, as you, you touched upon there is system systems thinking. And the problem is that doesn't come naturally to a lot of people, to be honest. I mean, we've seen it. You mentioned it in business, that why we have chaotic, chaotic situations in business all the time, because people can't think beyond a couple of tasks that's in front of them or people go immediately to task and solution rather than figuring out the whole process and system. Yes. And the thing that I think is so interesting about that is looking at the difference of the words, simple, complicated, and complex. And this idea that, you know, the DIY market, the do it yourself market, the HDTV, so home and garden television, mm -hmm. they have repeatedly um, boiled down uh, landscaping um, as this simple one, two, three, do it in a weekend, you know, buy it at the latest box store or, you know, and that everything is template and pattern and it, it undermines what the, the complexity of nature and the fact that part of our job as human beings, and this isn't just with nature, this is with our bodies, is that we have to become stewards of the body we're given, we have to become stewards of the land we buy, which means looking at it on a daily basis and making these micro assessments that begin to flesh out a picture of what's real. So it's not that someone couldn't landscape their own home. I actually wrote the book to be accessible. This was part of the difficulty too. Was I writing it for the pros or was I writing it for the homeowner? And I realized that both the pros and the homeowners actually needed the same thing they needed a, a, a more simplified explanation of something highly complex. So it meant going down into sort of this codified language while always paying homage to the yes and, maybe yes, maybe no, mm -hmm. that, that, that the truth of dealing with biological systems is that we have got to become master observers. Yeah, no, I, I love that because I, I do believe that uh, that we live in a world today that is so is so loaded against being an observer of any kind, not even a master observer, because we're so <laughs> distracted and everything is distracting us all the time and taking time out. And that's why it, it's funny, isn't it? And you, you've obviously experienced this on a daily basis. But if you do go into your yard, or you do go into a, a nature, but sometimes you just end up staring. Right, you literally end up staring, and for a moment you're you know you've got that kind of you you just abstract peacefulness as you're staring and looking at the at, and I think that's absent in work is that we don't have those moments of kind of abstract thinking that can help us because we're so busy and we're so distracted. Yes, the gap. I I it's it's the gap. We need the gap. We actually need to create ways in our work life, in our home life, in, in, in all things. I mean, even if you think about it, if you were exercising all the time, your muscles wouldn't have a chance to uptake the nutrients and the minerals and everything they needed to actually grow. You know, exercise is a process of breaking down muscles so that we can then take all of the things we need to then rebuild the muscles. So I really think, and, and the reason why lifescaping has turned into a coaching model um, is because I have realized that in the, like in my world, which is the service trade businesses, um, owners are so, they are so like they're behind the whip and they're, and they're, and they're driving forward all the time. And they actually get to work in nature. 
but they are not getting that amazing thing that you just described, which is that, that moment where everything just shuts down for a second. And it's almost like plugging into a charging station and mm-hmm. getting a little juice and, and then being able to come out and realize you were able to uh, grasp an idea or get, get an inkling of a solution. And so I think that from the lifescaping standpoint of what I do for my clients, business clients and homeowner clients, is to help them build spaces that encourage them to engage with those spaces, whether they're at work or at home, so that they can find their gap. And then on the coaching side, on the business side, it's doing the same thing within the atmosphere of your businesses so that you can cultivate the gap because that's where your best thinking is going to happen. Yeah, and I I couldn't agree more. And that's unfortunately, I think a lot of businesses and um, you know whether it's entrepreneurs be businesses it doesn't matter are missing out on that opportunity because they've allowed themselves get caught up in this you know rat race uh, distraction you know go 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 and they don't have those moments as i said they take those time out moments and the other thing that you mentioned there uh, earlier and i think this is very incredibly important for business too you said it's all it's um you have to do uh, minor micro tweaks and stuff all the time and that's and that's if you're going to have a system that works or a business that works it's going to be about yes you have your long-term plan and all of that but the tweaking that goes along and the consciousness about what's happening and being able to just uh you know fix a bit here be agile all of that that's what you need to bring into business as well i couldn't agree with you more um if you the beautiful thing about landscape is it's such a beautiful model for building anything um we want to talk about doing things holistically or organically or sustainably, but any construction project is surgical, right? It, it, it has a disruptive quality to it. Um, I actually loved your episode. I think it was with Stephanie Klein where she talked about disruption and I just thought it, it just had such great meat. Um, but all of the things that we do that really matter are in and of themselves rooted in disruption with a hope for something else. I think part of the problem of the mindset right now is that this kind of need for instant gratification, like we're going to do it. You can do this in, you know, 30 day challenge, get it done. You're going to be, you know, that it, um, it disrespects that the honorable work of these micro movements and the compound effect where, you know, you stack one micro movement onto another and you, you, you may not feel it in the moment, but you, you look back and you're like, wow, look at how far I came. That's, that's, that's awesome. And I think we just have to bring back the honor of that, the, the, the honorable baby steps, um, you know, that, a that, a that a child will take to become a marathon runner. They don't just get up and run. Um, and I, I feel like we forget that in lots of different areas of our lives. Yeah, and I think that's an that's an incredibly important point. And by the way, just you mentioned um, marathon runners. Uh, one guest I had on a, a year or two ago, uh, he was at one stage of his life totally unfit, heavily overweight, all of those things, um, sitting on his couch, and he decided he needed to make a change in his life, so he decided he was going to run a marathon. Oh, and you say, okay, how do you get from there to a marathon? So he did it by, he got up that day, he walked five minutes. And he got up the next day and he walked for seven minutes. And then he did, then he added on like a, you know, run. And long story short, he's run a bunch of marathons. But to your point, it's the, it's the baby steps. The huge goals are great. You need to have a goal, but you need to celebrate the baby steps, as you said, because otherwise you can lose, uh, you can lose uh, confidence in what you're doing very quickly. Yeah, you really can. And I think that, you know, more than lose confidence, what can happen that can be even worse is you see like this backpedaling you know, the, mm-hmm. the confidence gets lost and then there's sort of this erosion of will. And I see that a lot because I, I get a lot of young people coming through, um, my business, you know, I, I hire laborers, I'm in the blue collar worlds. Um, and what I want to do is I, I want to bring this, this set in and really help them to start to see where their value and their ability is. And, they don't get it right at the get-go. There's this sort of this, if I can't do it within a year, right away, I haven't achieved anything. Um, and so it's helping to create within the workplace these, these micro steps within a ladder of their career development. And as a business owner, as an, as an employer, 
my job, I believe that the employer job is to build that ladder, is to, sh to show what that ladder looks like and then show how you would get from one rung to the other. And I'm really not talking about handholding or spoon feeding. I'm, I'm just saying, this is the way. Show the way so that the people who come into your organization can actually have a chance at succeeding. And I think that way, the micro steps become, they become wins. And, and we yeah. can celebrate the micro steps as wins. And it, I really learned that looking at outside. If you look at the outside life cycle, we go from seed to germination, to early development, to growth, to maturation before death. And the thing is, is the growth maturation process, you know, for like an oak tree, that could be 200 something years. <laughs> and I'm yeah. looking at the tree and I can't see it growing. But if I look at the tree 10 years later, it clearly grew. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's I, a nice I, analogy. I, I think it's a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic analogy. And again, I think you're correct because unfortunately, um, there is the instant gratification. So um, even you see even people like come into jobs now and they, they want to be promoted two weeks later. Um, <laughs> and, and it is, no, it, it, and there's this, and I think everybody's been taught to be frustrated at where they are as opposed to, as you said, even looking at the baby steps they've taken to, to get forward. But outlining a path for them, I think is so critical. And I think that's why a lot of businesses are struggling to hold on to people right now because especially with the with the younger generation with the younger generation um <laughs> especially them <laughs> isn't it terrible when you get to that age when you toss your going or oh, the young people no today. right <laughs> um but but you know they're they're st they're not staying they're staying in jobs less than two years you know they're very mobile they move around you know they don't have so if if you're not if you're not conscious of this you're going to struggle Yes, I, I think that's true. And so I have been steeped in my coaching in, in recruiting. Uh, and I, I actually just did um, a class called Stop Hunting, Start Attracting Your Perfect Fit Employee. And I go through, um, I go through the, the, the ideas around retention that are the tools that you use in recruiting. And what I find is in our industry, it's a big revolving door. Sure. And um, it's, it's um, you know, human beings are used as resources and, and, then the, and, and effectively used up. And so I really believe that the way we're going to shift this, because I believe that the market now has become more savvy and they're like, you know what, I don't want, I'm, I'm not a resource for you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a resource for me. And so- I have noticed that it's been very, very hard for owners to change the way they're looking at recruiting. And I, my encouragement has been to look at retention, look at the tools of retention as ultimately the tools of attraction to, to get people in and then to keep them in. And it's been, it's been really interesting because I've been on this kick for about six months and, um, and it's been really, really cool to work with different businesses one on one to, to watch how they're making, again, these micro movements, because you can't make these movements all at yeah. once. You can't have a perfect training program in just because you decided you, you just have to start with one little thing. But I, I honestly believe that that's where the solution is going to be is to is to look inward toward our tools of retention. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's I think that's an excellent point. And I, and I think that people who do focus on that will win in the end, because I think there's yeah. there's a lot of craving for there's a lot of craving for that sort of sense of belonging or authenticity or purpose or all of this. And so it's a it's a complicated it's a complicated world, you know, regardless of whether it's landscaping or any other kind of business. Yeah. I mean, people people I would have just thought, though, to be honest, after the last two years of lockdowns, I bet you there's lots of people who'd love to work outdoors landscaping. I think that would be a nice break from <laughs> from being locked up in your home. So maybe maybe there's going to be a maybe there's going to be a lot of people trying to get in there. Um, it, you know, but it's very it, it's it is interesting. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I've seen it. It's it's been it's been interesting because there was a point uh, where people couldn't go anywhere. And so they were trying this. It was very interesting. We, we started an internship program and actually brought people in from all different, wow. uh, you know, types of work. And the, the bottom line with it is, you know, you're either going to love it or you hate it and you either can do it or you can't. I mean, it's one of those things where the line gets drawn. It really does get drawn, but it, it has been an interesting um, 
experiment. <laughs> Yeah. Have you just one 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 last comment? Because I uh, I was thinking this is, is as an analogy as well is um, because literally I say this because the people across the street from us just had their whole um, front redone, like landscaped mm. and all that. And I think compare it with a lot of things that you know will happen in business. So they start the project and then it's just then it's as you said destruction. Like the place is a mess. It looks yeah. awful all of that and then it gradually starts to take shape i feel like in business sometimes <clears throat> people are very reluctant to go through that week or two of the thing looking terrible and as you said that's where the backpedaling suddenly comes in like oh i don't know am i we doing the right thing um and that's why i think it's such a fantastic analogy is that is that you have to you know you have to have this creative destruction in order to bring something new to life it is it's absolutely true and i think it's about understanding how that disruption and destruction is creative it's intentional it has purpose it's not all over the place so construction also has its troubles where um the creep of destruct destruction can just be like like let's just blow it all up and you know and so like in my book i talk a lot about being precise like how the precision of disruption um, and the intention of the destruction is so important to set the stage for the rebuild. And I would say that, you know, that would be like an in business if I'm going to change my software. I, I need to, I need to map the runway. I need to show, you know, where is the point where I'm running one software and starting to install the other where other one? Where am I running the two softwares concurrently? What's my test period so that I can onboard one software, but the other one is still there as a backup? When do I finally pull the switch and move from one to the other? It's very it's similar in construction as well. And I actually have a whole chapter in the book which talks about what I call the peripheral intelligence of, of construction, which is the DIY market looks at building the patio. The professional market looks at everything from the conceptual idea and staging and mobilizing and traveling and purchasing and getting everything, build a patio. And now, now let's put, take the whole thing apart. So I think that all of our projects, you know, life projects, business projects, landscape projects have this, um, these peripheral items that we need to pay really, really good attention to. And when we do, then we, then we can be um, more creative and intentional about our disruption and destruction. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And as you said, I mean, there's so much interconnectedness so that if you're just focused, as you said, if you're just DIY focused on the patio, you're missing out on all these things. And I think that's the same in business. If you're just 100% blinkered focused on your own piece, and not looking at the ramifications or the connections or the efficiencies or whatever, then uh, mm -hmm. again, you're you're missing out. Definitely, definitely. It's we we've got to have our eyes, you know, really mm -hmm. really open and get practice in the peripheral in the peripheral vision. Um, and then of course the teams you build, right? So as yeah. a as an owner of a growing organization, um, I'm really all about how you build that team so that you really aren't the one and only. I mean, that that just yeah. doesn't, I'm all about collaboration over isolation because the collaborative effort, you're always smarter collectively than you are by yourself. And I think there's a, a an African proverb that's like, if you want to go, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I've always loved that. Yeah, that's fantastic. A great place to finish. Um, yeah. Listen, Monique, this has been fantastic. The book is Stop Landscaping, Start Lifescaping. Uh, all of uh, Monica's information, Monique's information is going to be below this video uh, with all the links, links to the book. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your business. Absolutely. Well, I my happy place is Instagram. So you can find me at monique.allen on Instagram. And I have a series there called Lifescape TV, where I drop concepts about cultivating long lasting joy and your entrepreneurial journey, which for me is so important. Like it's all about the lifestyle, not just hanging out at your fire pit, but also really, really enjoying um, what you're doing uh, in your life. And if you want to get a copy of the book, you can pop onto my website. We have a little shop button right on the upper right hand corner and you can order yourself one and I will autograph it for you. And um, awesome. Yeah, those are the best places. 
Fantastic. Listen, thanks again. This has been this has been fascinating. So uh, if you're if you're watching or listening, go out just go out into your backyard for a little bit and just stand and stare and see see what happens. See what happens if you yes. give yourself that abstract moment. <laughs> yes. Step into the gap. <laughs> yeah, step into the gap. I love it. All right. Listen, thanks again, Monique. Thank you for watching and listening. Talk to you all again soon. Thank you.